Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure this morning to introduce uh, a gentleman called Stephen Coulson to the Business Spotlight. Stephen is the Chief Science Officer and Founder of a fantastic organisation called P2I. Um, and I am going to say no more about it. We'll let Stephen explain it. So great to be working with you today, Stephen. Um, why don't you just explain to everybody a little bit about the organisation, the business, your journey to where you are today, please? Certainly, yes. Good morning, Alice. Um, great to meet you. So, um, yeah, P2I. So it was a technology that first set out in the late 90s to actually protect soldiers from chemical attack. So to provide a liquid repellent coating to military clothing. So if exposed to um, warfare agents like mustard or nerve gases, then the soldier would be protected and can go about their daily activities. And so that's where the research started. And so back up at Durham University, a project sponsored by the UK MOD or DSDL, as it was known at the time. And that led to the invention of our technology, which we now use and fully commercialize and put on a number of different products from, from filtration to biomedical to footwear and now mainly to electronics. So electronics is our main focus today. And it's a ultra thin barrier, the next generation of conformal coating to provide protection to electronics, increase their product life cycles to drive a circular economy. Wow. Wow. Fascinating. So what type of um, previous technology is, is your product superseding in, in the electronics field, Stephen? Yeah, so ever since electronics have been around, they've always been exposed to harsh environments. And so, sure. so there's been a need to protect them from those environments. And typically, this is about preventing corrosion damage. So people have used things like liquid-based conformal coats and paralin as an example, or they've designed in physical barriers such as O-rings and gaskets to prevent the liquid getting in in the first price and causing that damage. So what people are seeing today is although they gave good levels of protection, it's not the best level of protection you can give. And as people are using electronics more and more, you know, with the advent of 5G, Internet of Things, environments becoming harsher, whether that's to do with needing to protect from chemical environments or from harsher salt sprays or condensation or swings in temperature from say hot humid environments to air conditioned rooms, then there's a need to increase the reliability. And so P2I can deliver a technology that is faster, better and cheaper. Wow, it, I'm assuming that we're describing almost every electronic component that happens to be you know, in people's usage, both commercial, domestic, industrial, military, wow, fascinating. So here's a question for you, Stephen, that's going to take you back a bit, OK? Uh, we're two northerners, so we can say things like take you back a bit, can't we? Um, do you have any advice for your 18-year-old self? Go back to when you first went to university and you came up with this concept. What, what, what would you say to him if you could meet him at that point? I think it would be something along the lines of, of just not rushing forward, you know, spend time understanding all the different elements as you go and, and take that time to reflect on things, to lean into things, to, to fully learn and understand, not just about the technology itself, but the different opportunities and different people's points of view of where that could go and what those risks could be taking it forward. Mm. The old saying, you can't put a old head on a young pair of shoulders right but it's uh we, we we will have and we do have young entrepreneurs people watching the business spotlight that will take great uh credence from what you said there uh let's hope that they that they follow the advice so here's another question for you what business planning do you do and what format is it in? Because obviously the organization is, is significant. It's multinational. You have a, a substantial senior executive team, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, but I'm interested to understand what type of business planning you're doing. Yeah, I think it starts out with um, a strategy document of what you're trying to achieve from a, from a very high level, create that clarity at the start, and then attach to that the key performance indicators of how you're going to measure that success and then track against that success but mm -hmm. i think the the answer typically you know and we're a fairly smallish organization only a few hundred people but it's about getting the simplicity of that yeah. uh, 
documentation and reporting mechanism because anything complicated is just not going to get followed by people. Yeah, understood. Are you leveraging technology or are you leaning more towards the traditional type of business planning? You know, let's not say perhaps paper, but um, is it one dimensional or is it is it multifaceted? Can 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 the team slash organization access the plan? Is it is it centralized? Yeah, I think this, they're, they're all centralized and fed through the ISO system. So, you know, you create that clarity within those ISO formats, uh, mm. which creates that clarity and that access for people through a quality management system, but can be done with simple tools that are available, whether that's, you know, SharePoint, SAP, Mondays.com. There's a few tools that are going to help you and allow that sort of overarching nature for the different departments within the company to make sure you're all tracking the metrics that are the most important and allow you to do your bit in that chain. Interesting. I would say as well, um, I'm sure that you guys must be live editing because um, apparently uh, Eisenhower was labelled with this. We're not sure whether it is his statement, but, um, you know, the, the, the plan never survives first contact with the enemy. You know, it always requires evolution, doesn't it? So there needs to be uh, cascading through your organisation and live editing, which is which is interesting. So here's another question. And going back a little ways again in your evolution, um, what advice would you give to a new business owner around financial management? At the end of the day, we know that cash is king, don't we? Revenue is an outcome of marketing. Uh, profit is an outcome of delivering your product or service. Cash is the the, the ultimate uh, lifeline. Um, so what advice would you give to somebody stepping out, Stephen? I think the key thing that I've kind of learned and perhaps the hard way over the years is that When you're proving a new technology or a new business, it's not just about the technology. You're also proving the business model. So you Mm. really need to understand your costs at the the line item level to be Mm. able to work out what it is you need to achieve your strategic goals with what you said in mind, that cash is king. So Mm. you've got to preserve that cash and Mm. show that the returns are coming through with the business model you're adopting and looking at other business models to to increase that runway. And and at what point in your evolution did you make the decision to bring in, let's say, heavyweight financial guidance or management? Did that come early or did it come later for you? So for us, we were spin out from the UK Ministry of Defence. So effectively that happened at the initiation. So we brought in venture capital money right at the start because um, just the nature of the way the spin outs work is we needed sense. that investor to take it forward. So that happened right at the start for us. Yeah, perfect. So continuing the, the, the business evolution theme, um, if, if you can just bear with me for a second while I paint a picture for you. If you consider that level one is the early startup phase, level one of business ownership, it's the seesaw. There's mm-hmm. no money, yeah? Um, some customers, no customers. Some work, no work. Uh, level two is the evolution to the business that is a roundabout business, requires constantly being pushed, and the management team, the ownership team are uh, very much in the business. It's a vulnerable business because it's it's it requires uh, total dedication 24-7. Level three is the business that is the organization that's learned the ability to fly almost like the rocket, if you like, the autopilot. We can run it from Houston, but we're not on it. Uh, uh, sorry, we're not in it, should I say. Um it, 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 it's, it's, it looks to me as though your organization's a mature level three business. Um, it feels like that. I'll let you answer that question in a moment. But could you give me a feel for, um, you know, how maybe it's from the conception uh, or the inception of the business, but, but when, when did you reach level three and, and how does it feel? Yeah, so very much a level three business where we're looking to spend more of our executive time on the business rather than in the business, which I think is what you were sort of alluding to in the question. Uh, When did we get there? Well, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago, maybe. It's, It's difficult to actually pinpoint it, really. I mean, we still have aspects as we've simplified the structure over the years where you then start taking a more active role in the business, but you still can take a more overarching view on the business. So I guess we kind of fluctuate that in and on the business part of it, but Mm. um, it feels like things are much 
simpler and more focused now than the than they've been before. So there's been a a lot of times where you're you're rushing around, as you mentioned, perhaps on the level two basis. <laughs> so it feels very much level three. I mean, it's definitely level three now. Congratulations. But you get to know when that transition happens. You just kind of yeah. wake up one day and you feel like you've got more time to reflect on it than than just rushing and getting jobs done and putting fires out. Fascinating because I, I, I uh, reflecting now on some of the businesses that we guide and coach support, you you, you would find there that the the um, the prospect of level three business ownership is something that is eluding them. It's 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 mm. desperately attractive, but in reality, it's very difficult to get to. By our estimation, Stephen, we think there's around three percent of businesses in the community actually reach that point. So wow. if you said that 97% are struggling with level one, level two, working potentially to level three. So congratulations on, 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 a, on a job well done. We also have interesting view on this. We also suggest to people at level two that they will have, if you follow me here, the the um, the definition of wealth. OK, so think of it like this definition of wealth being the multiplication of freedom of choice of time and finance money, in other words. So the ability to choose when you work on your business and what you do with your life and the ability to choose what you do with your income, with your wealth, the money that you're generating through it all. Um, and at that point, level three becomes the ultimate position in business ownership. So what are your thoughts on that? I'm nowhere near level three. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> well, we got some work to do then. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next question for you then. So, what what are the barriers? What were the barriers to scale when you when you were you were, you were really pushing hard? Um, and and how did you overcome them? Yeah, good question. I mean, I guess it was kind of interesting because in the early days, you know, we're a UK based technology company with our biggest customers in the US and our manufacturing in Asia. So mm. you kind of a almost a global company in that description right from day one so certainly the the big things of going to any new territory so language culture yeah. time difference you know they're critical and so you've really got to have a a trusted person in those territories who are who understand those three aspects who can you know get on in the timeline of that territory whilst delivering all the necessary cultural and language challenges that the rest of us would face over there and you can only do that by fully bringing them on board you know if you don't have them fully in the the top team and getting all the information they need then it just makes it harder to to achieve that goal i think so understanding and taking calculated risk how important is that i mean it's massive isn't it you're not going to scale your business unless you understand and take calculated risk exactly yeah and i think you've got to be able to act on it quickly mm. when you realize it's not going in the right direction so yeah. yeah what we do today is very different to what we've done in the past so you know <laughs> we're course, learning yeah. from the mistakes and obviously yeah. the value of these exercises is to to help the community not to to, to learn from other people's mistakes rather than 100%. making them themselves 100 percent. so we have a little motto um uh, that goes a little bit like this, you know, the, the, the two pillars that, 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 that successful businesses stand upon are always marketing and people. Yes. Yeah. So so no matter how complex your products or your service, and let's be honest, yours is one of those, um, without effective marketing and without effective people, scale won't come. Level three won't come. No, that's right. I think you also need timing as well. I think timing has been critical. I think when we first launched our product, the Splash Proof product, Mm. It almost wasn't the right timing. Okay. Um, it was almost pre the the, the, the the take up. So I think timing's critical as well. But yeah, certainly people. You've got to get people who've yeah. done what you need them to do. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, that we could have a, a whole spotlight purely on that subject, right? For sure. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, so fi yeah. final question for you this morning, Stephen. Um, your executive team and your non-executive team is extensive and it's it's impressive to to read about on the website, p2i.com. Um, so what advice would you give to a small business owner that, uh, that that's working very much uh, without the, the, the power that such a leadership team brings? 
why would they be doing that? Well, they're early in their evolution. They, they, they may have fear around um, letting go or even investing in such uh, support. Um, I just wonder what, what suggestion you would make to them at that point. Yeah, I think they would need to tap into their network and their community. You know, there are people out there who have been there, done that, and are absolutely ready and willing to help. Now, yeah. it's not always a financial consideration. It may be some share options. It may be something else. Um, mm -hmm. But you, you've got to you've got to go and find the people who've solved the problems you face because they're out there. You know, we're not all facing new problems really. It's just a, a different version of something that's probably been solved before in the in the vast majority of cases. Very, very, very clear, very helpful, very wise. Uh, too many people try to do it on their own. Yeah, uh, That's one of the reasons why they get stuck at level two, um, uh, for sure. We call it the, the mountain of how. How do I get to level three? Well, routes through one and two are not necessarily the, the, the correct way. Often the most direct route to level three is the correct way. And that's what you guys have done, which is, which is wonderful, world class. So final question then, <clears throat> excuse me, Stephen, what, what does the future look like for you guys? Well, we're trying to reduce electronic waste. So we're trying to protect all electronics from corrosion damage. So at the moment, one in five electronic devices disposed of, only mm. about 17%, I think it is currently, is recycled. And mm. so if we want to promote the circular economy, drive sustainability and reduce the carbon footprint per product processed, then we need to protect those electronics from corrosion damage. So there's a lot to do there. I have to say, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with you um and i i think despite the fact that you guys are an international scale very successful growing organization that perhaps to some small business owners in the business community and medium it may feel like where you guys are is a long way from them in reality what you're doing is exactly what they're doing uh it's just on a different scale and the the, the same rules apply so Stephen, thank you so much for your time this morning it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you today um, um, and I wish you all the very best of luck in the future. Great. Thank you for the opportunity.